and Dr. Andrew Still. Uh, Dr. Still is the reason that osteopathic medicine exists. And you might see that he is Andrew Taylor Still, MD, DO. And that's because he was a Civil War surgeon before he created the philosophy of osteopathic medicine. And so this is kind of like one of his more famous quotes. It used to be everywhere in our old medical school building that, you know, to be the help, to find health should be the object of the doctor. Anybody can find disease. If you're not very familiar with osteopathic medicine, usually the first question is, what is it? <laughs> and so we explain it by saying it's a philosophy of medicine based on these four tenets. And sometimes people will just kind of intuitively know that it's a, a holistic approach to care. And that's true. So we take mind, body, and spirit into account when we're teaching our students how to work with patients. So your patient is a person, not a disease, you know, set of diseases or a set of symptoms. I mean, it's a person with you know, stressors and hobbies and family. And, you know, it, it's, you have to take all of that into account as you're working with your patient. Um, Dr. Still believed that the body has an intrinsic ability to heal itself. And very closely related to that, he believed that the body's structure and function are interrelated. So if you kind of mash <laughs> tenets two and three together, you get the foundation for what really makes the osteopathic physician distinct from their allopathic counterparts, and that's the use of a skill called osteopathic manipulative medicine. OMM is how we'll refer to it from here on out, but you also might see it in the literature as OMT, and that T could stand for therapy or treatment, and for our purposes, OMM and OMT it's all the same thing. I think the faculty have like different, you know, they slice it and dice it a little differently, but for our discussion, OMM, OMT, both acceptable. So we are teaching you to use your hands as a diagnostic tool, as well as a healing tool. So you are using your hands to manipulate the body's structure so it can function better. And when osteopathic medicine was kind of first coming around, there wasn't really a lot of evidence to back that up. People just knew they felt better after they had some OMM done. And now, thankfully, there's a whole body of evidence that is behind OMM. So if you're really curious about the whole neuromusculoskeletal aspect of it, um, there's a ton of research out there. But this skill enables the DO to offer their patients something that's non-pharmaceutical and non-invasive. Now, in the same breath, I'm going to say, as a DO, you will still write prescriptions, you can still do surgery, everything the MD does, you can do, but you have this special tool in your tool bag, so to speak, and it becomes really handy, pun intended, <laughs> if you are going to be maybe practicing global medicine or you're in underserved areas where there's just not a lot of facilities, if you have your hands, there's a lot you can do just with your hands. Also, in the same breath, I will say that OMM is not going to cure diabetes. It's not going to cure cancer. Um, the, you know, there's some things it can't do. It can't cure everything, but it enables your patient to use usually leave your office feeling better than they did when they walked in. So we can talk a little bit more about you know the specifics of how all that works um, you know, as we go on, but. Tenants two and three are very vital to the osteopathic philosophy. That fourth tenant just really kind of wraps everything up, but it's the, um, let's see, almost, almost of the Ohio Osteopathic Association, the American Osteopathic Association used to have a different tenant listed. And it's one that I like to bring up because I think it really um, exemplifies why people go into osteopathic medicine. And the tenant used to read that disease is an effect and not a cause. And honestly, when I first started this you know, position back in 2002, I was like, what does that mean? And that just sounded so vague. And we had a physician from New Jersey come and speak to our family practice club. And he told a story that just really kind of exemplified it. And like the whole light bulb went on for me. So I'm going to share that story with you, a very short version of the story. And if you're not already familiar with osteopathic medicine, maybe this will be your light bulb moment too. But 
this physician had a colleague and the colleague was a DO and he had a patient come to him with really severe shoulder pain. And the patient had been to all different types of healthcare professionals. Um, he tried physical therapy, he tried massage. I mean, he had injections, like all, all this stuff, but his shoulder just wasn't getting better. So somebody had said, oh, have you gone to a DO? And I'm sure the patient was like, oh, what's a DO? And they had a conversation kind of like we're having. So he's like, okay, I'll go try this DO. Now, when he goes to this osteopathic physician, one of the first things that you're taught is how to connect with your patient, how to ask them questions, but more importantly, you're taught how to listen. And so this doctor is asking the patient questions. He's listening very carefully to what the patient is telling him. Um, he goes about doing you know, the physical exam, doing the palpations. And as he's doing the palpations, he notices something doesn't feel quite right in the abdomen area. And I have to think that he was more sensitive to like to the sense of touch because of the skill you have to develop learning OMM. So as he's noticing something isn't quite right in the abdomen area, he asks more questions, runs some tests. And what he comes to find out is this man doesn't have a problem with his shoulder. What this man has is liver cancer, but the pain was radiating to the shoulder. And so like after he told that story, the whole group was like, wow. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, that's what you do as an osteopathic physician. You look throughout the entire body for the cause of the problem, and then you treat that, <laughs> not just the symptoms. So that doc could have done some OMM on the shoulder. Shoulder might've felt better for a couple of weeks, maybe even a month, but the problem wouldn't have been addressed until you take everything into account and you listen to your patient. So. If you don't take anything else away tonight, that's what I want you to know about osteopathic medicine. Now, why was it developed? I mean, we were just kind of chugging along, right, in medical history. But um, no, <laughs> back in Dr. Still's day, very much uh, a lot of the practices were doing more harm than good. And you can see a, a few of those things listed there, like you know, we're, we're not doing the bloodletting anymore. Um, you know, we have anesthesia now and we're not handing out mercury like aspirin. So it was kind of time for things to change. And it really kind of clicked for Dr. Still when three of his six children died from spinal meningitis. And, you know, he was a surgeon. He wasn't their primary caregiver. He just kind of had to stand and watch. And that's when he was like, we can do better. We've got to do better. So he set about kind of, you know, he took actually a step back from his practice and he took what he learned being trained as an allopathic physician, was paying attention to things that were happening in Europe, but also just kind of relying on what he saw as a practicing physician. And he developed the philosophy of osteopathic medicine. So in 1874, he proclaimed himself the first practicing DO. And in 1892, he built his very first um, school of osteopathic medicine. So that's the photo that you see in the back there. ASO is, stands for the American School of Osteopathy, as it was known back then. And it got its start in Kirksville, Missouri. So osteopathic medicine is, you know, very American, kind of Midwestern, I guess, in its origins, if you will. And then in the whole timeline of things, I just wanted to throw in there that it was not until 1975 that our school came into existence. And when that happened, we were only the 10th college of osteopathic medicine to come around. So it was kind of slow growth, but now what you are seeing is an explosion in growth of osteopathic medical schools. There are 38 now. Only eight of our schools are public and we are a public school, we're Ohio University. And when you're looking at all these geotags, what may not be so evident is where these schools are located. And kind of what I'm getting at is wherever there's an osteopathic school, it's usually in an underserved area, whether that's rural or urban. And it's kind of a thing for osteopathic physicians um, to go into primary care and serve the underserved and serve where the need is the greatest. You don't have to go into primary care as a DO, you can be an orthopedic surgeon, you can be a cardiologist, you can be an ophthalmologist, like whatever specialty you aspire to, you can do it as a DO, 
So there's just something about setting up in a community and taking care of families, you know, from birth to death and just knowing your patients that just kind of drives people to the profession. So um, even here in Ohio, like you really can't see <laughs> uh, very much here, but I'll I have a slide a little bit later that shows you where all of our campuses are. But I'm located in Athens, which is in rural southeastern Ohio. We have a campus in Dublin, which is right outside Columbus, our state capital, which is kind of suburban. And then we have a campus in Cleveland where Malcolm is, which is a little bit more urban. And you step outside of our campuses and you're seeing underserved areas. Our students really have opportunity to make impacts um, you know, in the areas where they are. So that's a little bit about where, where the schools are and how it's grown. Usually in this type of discussion, people are like, okay, so I'm getting it. I understand osteopathic medicine, but you know, what's the similarities? What are the differences? And so there are many more similarities these days than there are differences. Um, when it comes to actually training to become a physician, it's exactly the same. It's four years in a DO program. It's four years in an MD program where MD and DO admissions offices are all looking for the same things in terms of candidates. Although I think we, well, I don't want to sound egotistical or brag or anything, but I, I think we kind of do a bit better of a job of looking at applicants holistically. So like grades and CATs, yeah, important, but we're looking for a lot of other things too, which we'll talk about. But training, residency, there's only one residency accrediting body now. So everything about residency is the same between MDs and DOs, except if you want to continue doing osteopathic manipulative medicine, you can do an osteopathically recognized residency program so you can continue with those skills. Um, the differences are kind of few. Um, in, <laughs> Well, segueing into that, there are far fewer DOs in the United States than there are MDs. But right now, one out of every five students going into medical school is going into an osteopathic program. So it's going to be a while before we catch up into the MD number, but we're starting to make some strides there. Our board exams are always going to be different. Um, you know, the thing that has kind of become the same is when the USMLE went to pass fail on their step one, the osteopathic world also went pass fail on their part one of Comlex. But the exams will always be different because you're learning OMM as an osteopathic physician, and these are not. So we need to test you on OMM. So that's why the Comlex will always be the board exams for DO students. Now, we can talk a little bit about, gosh, do you have to take both boards? Some students do. Um, when in 2020, when single accreditation kind of started, it was with the intent that all residency program directors would accept COMLEX scores. And what we've seen in the last you know, handful of years is not really working out quite like we'd envisioned. So there's legislation now called the FAIR Act, which is basically trying to force program directors to really kind of hold to the fact that DO stu students shouldn't have to take both boards. You should only have to take COMLEX and that should be good enough. So um, I think it's still gonna be a while though before students feel comfortable <laughs> in only taking the COMLEX. We do have about, I think, 60% or so of our students who will take both board exams, but you have to take COMLEX if you're a DO student. If you're curious about residency and how long it's gonna take like to actually get through everything. So four years of med school. And then depending on the specialty you choose, you have X number of years of residency. Um, but again, it, it's all the same. And we're actually kind of getting into residency season. We've just, uh, we've been notified that we had one student match into urology. No, we had three students match into urology, one student match into ophthalmology, which are some of the more, um, I guess, not restrictive, but uh, more competitive programs. And then everybody kind of finds out their residency matches in March. But um, yeah, so med school is not the end of it, as you probably know. You got to get through residency as well. If you're wondering where you can find a DO, 
Luckily, you're going to find them in all specialties and subspecialties. You're going to find them in all 50 states. You can find them in 65 countries worldwide. And you're going to find DOs, you know, serving in state legislatures. You're going to find them, um, you know, making public policy, um, you know, doing research. A lot of times people don't think of osteopathic physicians and research in the same sentence. But here at Ohio University, we're a research one institution, which means we have a, a pretty large research output. We have a lot of research funds coming in. And so that's something that we strongly encourage our students to get involved with. And it doesn't always have to be bench or biomedical science research. We do a lot of social medicine research as well. But if you see yourself going into academic medicine, if you wanna teach future physicians one day, you can do that as a DO, no problem. So I'm gonna take a breath and I'm gonna see if Malcolm has anything that he would like to add or see if there's any questions or discussion. Uh, one thing. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Ask your question. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I know you just mentioned the types of research that students do, um, and you mentioned that social research is an option. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some projects that students have done in the past um, in social research. Yes. So, and and Malcolm, chime in here too because it's your colleagues who are actually doing a lot of this research. Um, you know, opioids. We, we're all aware of the opioid crisis. We have faculty and students who have been doing, you know, research into that, you know, how it affects families. Um, we do, oh gosh, it just slipped my mind. Uh, we do a lot of research on health disparities and social determinants of health. Um, and I'm trying, Malcolm, you'll remember the student, um, I'm forgetting her name, but she's doing a lot of research on um, maternal mortality rates, especially in the Cleveland area. Oh, gosh. I know her. Um, I actually featured her on our journal, on our SNMA journal some time ago, maybe in December. She's great. Yeah. Why can't I remember her name? Jocelyn. Jocelyn Hines. Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, that's just a couple examples, but um, if you want like the full research story, um, just our website is ohio.edu slash medicine, and then there's like a drop down for research and you can just kind of, you know, spend all night <laughs> kind of perusing all the different types of things that we do. Thank you. Sure. Ah, I, I don't... Are you saying we should connect Jocelyn with Kayaba Care? I was looking in the chat. Sorry. Uh, yeah, actually. Hi, my name is Diani. Um, it would be awesome to connect her with Kayaba Care. They're a company um, in the East Coast that are expanding throughout the United States. Um, I used to work for them, but they are actually um, providing like uh, care for maternal women of um, minorities in different states um, as like additional support. And they also help pediatrics at the same time. They're the first type of company in the United States that are specifically geared towards uh, minority women, specifically black women. It might be super helpful for her to connect with those um, people there because it's an emergency doctor, pediatric doctor and gynecology. So it might be super helpful. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. So of course. Okay, since we're recording this, I won't have to write that down. We'll just- we'll... No, of course, yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Great. What else? Well, do you I had a question about how do students choose a campus and what is the um, collaboration like between the three different campuses? Mm -hmm. So I'll talk about how to choose the campus, and then I would love Malcolm to actually talk about the the day to day <laughs> of how all that happens. So with the campuses, with the Dublin campus. Um, you know, it's located in central Ohio. And when that campus came about, it was because Ohio Health, which is a large health system there, they were interested in having people who were either from central Ohio or who had ties to central Ohio, who would want to go to medical school, hopefully do residency and stay and practice in that area. So for people who wanna to go to Dublin, it's really helpful to have some kind of tie to central Ohio. 
it's the same concept in Cleveland, but with the Cleveland Clinic. They were interested in kind of, you know, everybody knows the Cleveland Clinic for their specialists, not maybe so much for their primary care, but, you know, they wanted to, to boost their primary care presence. And so they're interested in HCOM students who are either from Northeast Ohio or have ties to Northeast Ohio um, who would want to stay, you know, and train and practice there. So for Dublin and Cleveland, you really do need to have some type of either tie or reason for wanting to be in that particular geographic area. And you mark your campus preferences on our secondary application. There's no, like, it's just one application fee. You don't have to like pay a separate fee for each campus you rank. You just go in there and, you know, hopefully, hopefully you'll rank Athens one and want to come down to Athens, but you can rank them however you want. And then when you interview, you're interviewing for a spot at the campus that you ranked as your first preference. Now, you don't always get assigned <laughs> to your first preference. Sometimes the committee feels that there's not a strong enough tie, or it could be that that campus is full because we do have, we've got limited seats at all of our campuses, but we only have 64 seats available in Cleveland and 72 seats available in Dublin. Um, if that happens and there's a spot, you know, in Athens, we'll give you a spot in Athens and put you in a waitlist position for your first choice campus, and then hopefully get you there as you know, people leave the class and the class shifts around. But um, yeah, we try to honor your first campus preference. It's not always possible, but we encourage people to go you know, visit our campuses, explore all the different options because it's one college <laughs> with three campus locations, um, but each campus has its own special personality. So I'll let Malcolm take over from here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, we uh, we have a different, the way our curriculum set up is a little different. Uh, I don't know if Ms. Joe's getting into it at any point, but uh, the, the curriculum is definitely a little different. Uh, so uh, the way we sit uh, is in groups of eight. We sit in groups of eight and we kind of collaborate with uh, our teammates and whatnot. And the way we collaborate with the other campuses is we have a mic. Uh, we have a mic at the uh, center of our table. Uh, and we have a, a camera at the center, the center of the table as well. So we uh, are connected and that's at every single campus. So uh, no matter if you go to Athens, Dublin or Cleveland, you'll be sitting in a group of eight at a table with a mic in the middle of it, with a monitor uh, at the end of it with a, a camera uh, looking at your, your group. And then you'll have monitors uh, all throughout the room uh, that has either the content or the other uh, whoever's presenting, if it may, if it's from a different campus. Uh, and it's a flip classroom, so the large, uh, the main way that we uh, uh, we go through our day to day is our, the professors are asking us questions or whatnot. Uh, so he'll like the the professor will ask. They'll be in Athens and they'll ask a question, and then they'll call on Cleveland Group Six, and you'll hit the mic at the center of the table, and then you'll interact. So the the interaction during class, you interact a lot. Uh, outside of class, it's honestly whatever you kind of make it. Uh, but during class, you're connected the whole time. Professors, so we have professors at each campus. Uh, you have access to them, and they're they're generally very good at responding to emails. Uh, if you if you're emailing them and whatnot, uh, so uh, I guess that's the general overview. Without getting like too much in the weeds, if you guys have any questions, I can uh, answer. But that's the general overview of, of the connection between the different campuses. Okay. Thank you. All right, I'm looking in the chat. So I see on the website, there are opportunities to engage in global health work as a student. Would you mind talking a little bit about your experiences with and or impressions of this aspect of HCOM? So I'm gonna, Malcolm, do you, I don't I don't know that you've studied or gone abroad, but do you have colleagues who have? And could you Yeah, I, Brady, Brady, he did, that's what he did uh, this summer. Uh, so I, I did have a friend, I had two, actually three, three people that I know four actually i'm sorry the numbers keep growing uh i have a bunch of people i know that uh, studied abroad uh they uh i don't have the i don't know the super details about it but i know that uh, uh there's a group that goes to south africa uh every year uh, every summer 
and uh, they uh, you have the opportunity to to study abroad that way in South Africa with with that uh, the South African population is a uh, I know it's a little bit of, of of serving the community a little bit of shadowing a little bit of sightseeing it's a little bit of of all that stuff uh, but again I'm sorry I don't have the super details but I know that uh, South Africa is is something you're you're able to do uh, I don't I feel like there's something else but I don't know. I don't know it enough to even like mention it, but I feel like I feel like there's something in South America, but I don't I don't know that off the top of my head. Uh, I hope that answers your question. The one I'm most familiar with is our um, Tropical Disease Institute. Um, students can go abroad as part of that, and one of the things that they do is they go to um, Quito, Ecuador, every year. And it's kind of a little bit of social medicine <laughs> and kind of a little bit of clinical medicine. Um, the lead faculty member is Mario Grijalva. And I honestly think this man should have some kind of Nobel Prize, but he basically found a way, well, let me put it this way. Um, people who would get blood transfusions in Ecuador would always end up with like Chagas disease and like people weren't catching it. And long story short, Dr. Grijalva found, found that this was the problem and found a way to clean the blood, like to, to, to fix it. So if people had a blood transfusion, they had less of a chance, if you know, no chance of contracting Chagas from the blood transfusion. And um, Chagas disease is transmitted by this really, to me, it's an ugly bug. If you love bugs, I hope I don't offend you, but it's a bug called the chinchero bug. And when it bites you, like, it leaves feces behind and it's the feces that gets into the skin that causes Chagas, which has an impact, I think, on your, your heart and your brain, all that. So when students go into this, you know, they're going into communities, they're helping educate families on how to keep the chinchero bugs out. Um, and they're also like, they're doing a lot of um, geomapping, just kind of making sure that, you know, they've hit all the residences it's helpful if you know a little bit of Spanish, but you don't have to know Spanish to do this. And then the other thing they'll do is go into clinics and basically just do basic histories and physicals and look for signs of Chagas and then refer you know, to other places if they, you know, if they detect it. So not all of the experiences I don't think are that in-depth, but I do, I definitely agree with Malcolm. I think there is kind of that social medicine side and also a clinical side of wherever you go. And also you get to have some fun too. So. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let's jump in here. Um, I've already, I think I've already alluded to our mission, um, but here it is kind of in, in plain English. We exist <laughs> to produce primary care physicians to serve the state of Ohio um, because we are a research institution here at Ohio University. That is part of our mission, but we're also very driven to take care of the people who are part of our communities, whether that's urban areas or Appalachian, Ohio areas. This gives you a better look at A, where the campuses are located, because that other map wasn't very helpful. And um, B, it kind of gives you a look at, you know, the fact that we are kind of Ohio heavy here. Again, we're a state supported school. We do like our out of state students. We will bring in out of state students and we will interview you, we'll accept you. Um, but sometimes, you know, at the end of the day, people want to stay in their home state and go to school. So we often, lose the out-of-state students that um, that we accept and would love to have here. Um, Mal Malcolm, if I could pick on you one more time, we got super lucky with Malcolm because he's not an Ohio resident and, and we, I don't know, did we brainwash you? How do we, we, we convinced you that Ohio is where you needed to be. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like I, uh, so I'm, um... I, I spent a lot of time in West Virginia, grew up in Pittsburgh, uh, lived in the D.C. area for a while. So I'm, I'm kind of traveled, if you will. Uh, and I really think I, I so my, my whole journey to med school, it was a very long journey. I graduated 2016, didn't start med school in 2021, uh, but I applied to a lot of different schools, had a, a chance to interact with a lot of different schools. Uh, but I, I really, and this is this isn't me just talking because I go to OU, but I really feel like OU was the one school that actually cared like I wasn't this like super stellar applicant like I didn't have the craziest numbers uh but I felt like I'm a, uh, I'm a genuine person and uh I 
am passionate about medicine. And that is what OU cared more about than my numbers. So when that was made evidently clear, it was just a no brainer that like, why would I try to like bust my butt to go to these other schools that only care about my numbers versus a school that actually cares about who I'm at, who I am as a person. And that's largely how I believe I was evaluated uh, to be accepted. And I feel like this is something that's not like, is like an idea that's no like practiced everywhere, which I could be wrong because I mean again like it's the only school I go to, but uh, I just felt that genuine connection with OU, so that's that's definitely what uh, made me choose OU. Thank you for that. And I haven't like I'm not paying Malcolm. He, he's not scripted. Malcolm's telling you straight from Malcolm. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't think I'm influencing him anyway. We've known each other for so long. He knows he can say anything in front of me. <laughs> okay. So we get a lot of applications. Um, Ohio is our largest application producing state. Last year we had 842 applications from Ohio, but we get them from all over the nation. This slide makes it pretty evident that out of all the applications that we get in any given year, the out-of-state application population is the largest. And so it is an advantage if, you're, if you are an Ohio resident applying to OUHCOM. If you're like, huh, I'm not an Ohio resident, is it worth it to apply to OUHCOM when there are 4,300 other people in the pool? Um, yeah because you're here tonight and I can see all your names and I can go back to the recording and I can say, yeah, they showed up at this region five thing and they must really be interested. Um, you can reach out and email me questions. You can participate in some of our summer programs. There's all kinds of things that you can do to make yourself stand out in that massive sea of, of applicants there. So it's not impossible. This is a, a chart that just kind of shows you how it all breaks down from all the applications that we get. We're going to interview, let's just round it up to 500 people. So we're going to interview about 10% or so of uh, the people who apply. And the number that 379 under the 2022 column, that is the number of people that we you know, outright accepted on interview day. And also the people who had been on our wait list that we offered an acceptance to. Now, not everybody that we offer a spot to off of the wait list is still there. Sometimes they you know, go to other schools or have other plans and they don't tell us until we call to say, hey, we have a spot, are you interested? Um, but they do count in that number of offers. But we do all that to get down to our target number, which is you know, usually 250 students. It can vary. Uh, I think our actual target for this year is 256. So it's you know around in there. But Long story short, only about 5% of the people who apply will, will find a spot. But, you know, again, it's still not impossible. If you're wondering about, hmm, what kind of metrics <laughs> do I need to have? Well, these aren't metrics that you need to have to get into HCOM. This is just what happened to be the metrics of the class that came in um, this past fall. Um, the overall, you will see that it was a 3.62 science GPA and a 504 MCAT. The range of those, though, was a, a 490 on the low end for the MCAT and a 521, I believe, on the high end for the MCAT. And then in terms of GPA, I think we had 2.63 as the low end and then, of course, a 4.0 as the high end on the GPA. So we're looking at all kinds of things in our applicants. We're looking at your grade trends. We're looking at you know, the strength of courses that you've taken. Um, you know, are you in a second career? There's all types of things that we look at. So the, the MCAT and the science GPA, they are important because there's predictive value, some would say, on how well you might do on the boards. And so we do have to pay attention to those things but it's not the be all end all of our decision making. This is what we feel makes a competitive applicant. And I will say that was that bullet one, two, three, four, five, bullet point five, the resilience and the adaptability. If you have that, that is what's gonna get you through med school. Um, 
when we accept you, we accept you because we feel you can do the work that you're, you know, solid in your sciences and, and all that stuff is going to go. But in medicine, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> and if you're somebody who can't roll with the punches or, you know, if you're somebody who's never had an obstacle to overcome, med school is going to be a, a huge wake up call <laughs> for a lot of people who have never had a failure <laughs> in their life. You, you've got to know how to bounce back from those things. So out of all of that, I think resilience and adaptability is kind of the thing that we look for first and foremost. In terms of preparing for med school, um, the prereq courses are pretty much the same. Um, I think the only difference here is like MD schools uh, require some math. We do not have a math requirement, but you do have to have a C or better in eight hours minimum of biology, general chemistry, organic chemistry, and physics, and then six hours of behavioral science, which is like your psychology, sociology, anthropology, and then six hours of English. We do count AP credit. If you've tested out of those courses, that those credit hours will count, but you will always want to do more than just the basic prerequisites. So um, I don't know what stage everybody is in their education, but keep taking all those upper level ologies that you can. Um, the highly recommended courses you see, biochemistry. You gotta, you gotta have that before you sit for the MCAT or you're just spinning your wheels, I think. Um, anatomy is super important in our curriculum. So if you can come in with an anatomy background, oh my goodness, your group members love you. Same with pharmacology. So Malcolm, from your perspective, are, are we missing any courses? Like what would be helpful for somebody to take to actually prepare them for the HCOM curriculum? Yeah, so I think I'll just double down on the anatomy. The way the anatomy is taught in our curriculum is a little different. So having a, a stronger background in it, 100% helps. Like I would, if you haven't taken ed, like something higher or something more than just A&P one and two, I would suggest it. It's not impossible. I know I know plenty of my classmates who haven't done that or who didn't do that and who are doing just fine now. I'm just if knowing beforehand, if you have this time in your schedule or if you're trying to decide or not, if you can take uh, an anatomy class beforehand, I would highly, highly recommend it uh, for our curriculum specifically, because uh, the way it's taught is not it's not like it's a it's a self-paced. Our curriculum, our whole curriculum, self-paced. But that that aspect of it is the most self self-paced. So if you could come in with a, a back, uh, if you could come out come in with uh, a background in it already, uh, that would be very helpful. Like that. That's I took I took a couple different anatomy classes after just AP one and two, and that like drastically helped me with that curve. Uh, so uh, I that's something I uh, I definitely uh, suggest. Uh, like 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 what Joe said, biochem biochem is. Um, it's just a, a very important class. I mean, biochem is pretty tough. I'm studying for boards now, and uh, biochem is like one of the the most challenging things that I have to to get down. So if I would have, looking back now, if I would have uh, took it a little bit more serious before I came in, uh, uh, in undergrad and whatnot, it'd be more beneficial. But uh, I, I think that's about it. I was going to say, and I think you set me up pretty nicely to actually start talking about the curriculum. So our curriculum has a name. It's called the Pathways to Health and Wellness Curriculum, or PHWC. And this curriculum was launched in 2018. And before we had the PHWC, we actually had two separate curricular tracks. We had one problem-based track and one more kind of systems-based track. So what we did was we really kind of took the best out of both of those and then really kind of ramped up the technology that we use in terms of instructional delivery. And then we were also kind of putting an eye towards what you were going to need to know as a healthcare professional, as a physician in the 21st century. So this curriculum, it's, it's a little bit different. It's a different way of looking at things. It is that flipped classroom approach. So we don't really have lectures like we all grew up with lectures in our med school. You'll have some classes that'll like feel like lectures, but we don't have lecture halls even. We have active learning classrooms where everybody's kind of at, at pods or at tables in a group. And 
the idea is that you will use um, clinical cases to learn all your medical knowledge. And we have it structured in such a way that in your first year, your first semester, it's called the wellness semester or the wellness block, if you will. And all of your cases are going to deal with well patients. So you'll you know, see normal physiology, kind of normal anatomy, those kinds of things. You'll have about 10 to 15 cases uh, each semester that you'll go through. But as you actually, before you get into the cases, you're going to get a document called uh, a prep guide or a session guide. And I'm definitely going to want Malcolm to talk more about all this, but um, the session guide will have uh, course objectives or you know session objectives as well as all kinds of material. And you can open up the session guide and say, hmm, there's no way humanly possible a person can digest all this information within 10 days. And you'll be right. <laughs> so there's going to be a lot of information, but the pace and the volume is, you know, is pretty intense. But as a group, you'll figure out how to get through that information. When you come into class on a Monday, you're going to take an exam called a RAT, and that stands for Readiness Assurance Test. You'll take one as an individual, so you'll have an I RAT, and then you'll take one as a group. That's your G RAT. And the RATs are to kind of help you figure out where the gaps are. And so you're not, it's always really comfortable for us to keep studying the stuff that we know, but you need to know the stuff you don't know. <laughs> so those rats kind of help you figure out where that is. And then as you're going through the curriculum, your second year, or I'm sorry, your second semester, you have acute illness cases. Some of the cases are going to follow you. So you begin to build a longitudinal look at patient care. When you get into the second year, your first semester is chronic illnesses. Then you do a return to wellness, which is where Malcolm is right now as you're kind of studying for the boards. And one of the, I don't know if it was intentional or if it just turned out to be a genius thing, but with this curriculum, you are constantly reviewing things. Uh, I think Malcolm, the term is you do the look backs and all that. So you don't just see something once, you're seeing it multiple times. So as you are preparing for the boards, as you are trying to remember all of this so you don't kill a person later on, you know, you've had multiple levels of exposure. So I'm going to stop there and, and see what Malcolm wants to add. Yeah, I guess the first thing is, is uh, you're listening to this now and it's even if you think it makes sense, you don't completely understand it. Like hearing this for the first time, it doesn't like you can't completely grasp the idea because that it's just something so different. Uh, and I think one thing to to one thing to like a couple of things to emphasize. Is, so it's a flipped classroom. So you're like you're not going to be you're not going to come to class and the professor is just going to like spoon feed you all of these all this information. You're going to come to class and you're going to need to like already have understood something in order to effectively engage in that. Now, I mean, I like it's not like like life happens. You're not always going to come to class super prepared. Like here's a point this week. I, I was prepared every other day except for today because I didn't get to the stuff for the day yet. So I had to like move my schedule around and I'm have to get to this stuff another day, but I was still trying to like I was still able to engage in class like based off of past knowledge and everything because I'm so late in the, uh, in the curriculum. But uh understanding that that's how that dynamic is going to go, I think it's something it's super important because like a lot of people get here and it's just like you get the you get out of your first iLab session and it's like, okay, like what what else like I didn't I didn't get anything like. I, I need to like go through this whole like process. Like you're not going to go through that whole stuff. They're going to give you resources and you're going to have to go through it yourself, uh, which a little hard to adjust to at first, but uh, you then get adjusted and it's not like the, the worst thing ever. Uh, rats, rats are like, even, even me telling you this, like you shouldn't freak out about rats. Everyone, you're going to freak out about a rat. Like that's just what you do uh, because you're being assessed. So you're being assessed and that like freaks everybody out. But the way the way these quizzes are, which I look at them as quizzes, like the way they're, they're quizzes, they're formative. They're so it's a formative assessment. So you're like like Michelle was getting at, like you're for, like 
you're really formulating like you're studying around this you're not really uh it's not really like oh you're supposed to know all this stuff by this day because the way that like this prep guide is set up i wish they're called session guides now yeah. uh, the way that these session guides are set up like they're super long so for you to be an expert on everything it's like if you if you can do it like kudos to you i am not that person i'm not an expert on the session guide every single monday uh, and I'm in my my last semester here, so like you can you can still be effective. Uh, and the biggest the biggest idea about it is self paced. So it's on you. Your education is largely on you. If you're struggling with something, you have to reach out. If you don't, if you need like a little bit more understanding on this anatomy topic, you got to reach out. Like you and and OU has a lot of very good resources. If you're uh, if you're struggling, if you need a little bit more help, uh, if you need like. Uh, uh, some tutoring. So I'm actually an APSL, which an APSL is basically just a tutor. Uh, you can schedule tutoring hours and everything. So uh, understanding, understanding, though, like, it's a lot on you and not the curriculum, or it's not, it's a lot on you and not like, you're not being spoon fed this information in every single lecture. Uh, I think it's like the biggest idea to understand at this point, because you're going to have to make a decision uh, because you're going to get accepted to multiple different schools because you guys are all great applicants and you have to understand the difference in the curriculums and you don't want to make an uninformed decision. Uh, I personally love the curriculum because of the cyclical nature of everything. So like I'm going over like today, today we had uh, we had a, a lecture or not a lecture, we had an eye lab session on uh, the eye anatomy. Like we're going over different like uh, different eye uh pathology we went over eyes like last semester so it's like i'm reviewing this stuff i get a chance to review this stuff uh, i've seen a lot of this stuff already so uh that aspect of the curriculum is is wonderful uh and uh the a session guide the the easiest way for me to explain a session guide is everyone everyone probably knows what a syllabus is like you get you like you get a class like you first order class and they, the teacher gives you a syllabus a syllabus i mean a prep guide is basically a syllabus for the week and you have to go through that syllabus and understand all the different all the different points which the points in a session guide is the same thing as the the question so you have the different or objectives you have the different objectives that you have to answer uh, and a lot of the ideas are very vague so an objective idea would would be uh describe uh describe uh thyroid thyroid hormone synthesis that'll be the objective and there's literally like acres on top of papers on top of different researches on top of like you can literally spend the whole day on just that and the idea is for you to 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 give you the objective and you go through it at a depth that uh that you're going to understand not at the beginning because it doesn't really make sense but as you go on you're going to understand what it is they want you to understand from it but if you want to go super deep and be this like super expert on it you can do that if you want to if you want this superficial understanding which at the beginning that's really going to be the uh, the idea then you can do that as well and both people could be successful because they uh engaged in it in the way that they wanted to personally so uh that's really what the whole self-paced idea is. Like we could, I, I have, I'm in a group of eight people. Uh, that's that's what the, the group size is for for your uh, your class your classes. Not every every single one of us are at a different point with the material at any given moment. Like some people are a little bit more ahead, some people are a little bit more behind, some people are, are right on pace. Uh, and like you could, you really you really have a chance to engage in it in the best way that, that suits you. So. I hope that kind of uh, made sense. If you have any questions again, just feel free to ask. Awesome. All right, come on in. Okay, so here's a look, <clears throat> kind of another look at how all the curriculum is laid out. Um, we're showing you a little bit about third year. So third year is all of your rotations and it depends on which campus you are located at as to where you'll be doing these rotations. Ohio University doesn't have its own medical center, so we basically use the entire state of Ohio. But this 
again, kind of gives you just an overall look at what you're going to be doing all four years. So um, kind of pro tip, the last free summer that you'll ever have is the summer between your first and second years of medical school. <laughs> and so after that, you're in school 12 months a year, then going into residency and, you know, it's the real deal after that. So um, plan accordingly. <laughs> This is a look at all of our clinical training sites. I apologize, because I don't think you're really able to see that whole list of hospitals, um, but this is on our website out there. But everywhere there is like a dark green dot, that's one of our, like our major sites. And when you're at Dublin or Cleveland, that's where you're going to be all four years. So if you're at Dublin, your rotations are going to be out of Ohio Health Hospitals, and you're going to stay in Central Ohio. If you're in Cleveland, you'll stay in Northeast Ohio, and your required rotations will run out of Cleveland Clinic Hospitals. Keep in mind, Cleveland Clinic covers a wide footprint in Northeast Ohio, so it's not just downtown Cleveland. You could be in Ashtabula. You could be in Worcester. I mean, you could be anywhere. If you're at the Athens campus, you could really be anywhere in the state except Central Ohio and Northeast Ohio. You could be in Toledo, uh, you could be in Lima, you could be in Dayton, you could be in Portsmouth, you could be in Youngstown, but no matter which hospital that you get assigned to, you're going to have excellent training. Um, a lot of these hospitals are a little on the smaller side, which is nice because you're not stacked behind, you know, six other residents who are trying to be an assist on a surgery. Like if you're at Portsmouth and they're doing a surgery, your first assist, you're, you're like right there. <laughs> there's, there's no one else in front of you. So each of these hospitals will give you a great experience, but just like anything, you know, you're just going to have its own little flavor too. So you, you better do some research on the hospitals. Um, if you're at the Athens campus, you'll be asked to rank those. And then we'll go through basically a lottery process to match you with your hospitals. But if you're at Dublin or Cleveland, you already kind of know where you're going to be. And I'm talking a little bit faster now because we're coming up on our, uh, on our hour, but I, and we're almost done with the slides, but I want to make sure we get your questions answered. This is just a look at what a week looks like. And one of the biggest things that I want you to walk away with knowing about our curriculum is that we do try, and I think we do an okay job, but we try to stress wellness in our curriculum. So you do get wellness time blocked off. We know that, you know, well, we know it's hard being a med student, you know, there's so much and, you know, physician suicide, physician burnout, those are all very real things. And if you're not coming into medical school, knowing how to take care of yourself, we want you to develop that skill in medical school. So you, know, you can't take care of other people unless you're taking care of yourself. So we want you to have that time to do that. And, you know, wellness time is whatever you want it to be. Um, you can study more if you want to, you can go hike, um, get the oil change in your car, like whatever you need to do, that is your time. And then you'll have, you know, labs and you, all these rats and things that we're talking about. So, you know, it's a pretty doable schedule, but you do have to be a good time manager or things will get away from you pretty quickly. Just real quick with that. Uh, so we have two hours of OMM a week which I know that's not the same everywhere, but like you'll have like two hours of OMM a week and any more than four hours in a day is like an anomaly long day. Like four hours is generally how many, how much time you'll spend in class. And that's like most days. So just, that's just to like make that make a little bit more sense. Cause I know it looks like a little different. Mm. All right. So I just have two more slides after this, but what's what's on your mind? What haven't we covered yet? Like I can still talk like for two more hours on stuff I know we haven't covered yet, but what's important to you? <laughs> You're like, what's important to me, Joe, is getting some dinner. It's about the dinner time. <laughs> so here's the um, last two slides I've got. If you would like to know more about the real OUHCOM, I really tried to give you a real sense of that with this presentation, but we do have an organization called PreDoc, 
And um, hopefully if you have QR code readers, you can just scan those real quick. But pre-doc is like a, a pre-med club basically for, well, it started out just to be the entire state of Ohio, but we have people from all over who join it. And it gives you a chance to interact with our students, with our faculty. Um, we do some on-campus things and you'd be invited to that. So it's just a way to stay connected with the college once a month and, and really get to know who we are and our students and our faculty. Um, the podcast is called Please Use the Mic because we are connected. <laughs> we do synchronous education between all of our campuses. And um, if you don't use the microphone, nobody at any of the other campuses can hear you. So you'll hear this disembodied voice say, please use the mic. And you'll hear it like, I don't know, 50 times a day. So that's what we call our podcast. And it was started by one of our first year students, Suzanne Shar, who's um, from Florida. So again, out of staters, they, they will enroll. <laughs> and then um, a shameless plug, um, my husband is also on the podcast. His name is Mark Loudon, and he works in our um, at medical education technology department. So like he's with the students every single day. So um, it's not really sanctioned by the college. So it's not like the dean is saying, hey, cover this topic. It, it's all driven by what Suzanne wants to do, and it's all very real. So I would encourage you to check those out if you want to know more about us. And then if you have questions, and hopefully you'll have some more questions, this is how you can reach out to the team. So again, I am down in Athens. We have Terry Porter in Dublin and Bree Cook in Cleveland. So we welcome you to reach out to us either by email. The toll-free number actually just rings down here in Athens, but we can connect you to, you know, to whomever you want to speak with. But, you know, we we care about producing good osteopathic physicians. And if you're somebody who is interested in what we do and you want to be here, we want to help you with that. So just use us as resources and let us know how we can help. And so that is officially the end of my presentation. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Ms. Harmon, and thank you, uh, Malcolm, for coming tonight. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. Um, I actually did enjoy this presentation, <laughs> even though I'm no longer applying to med school. I love learning about, you know, what other people are doing. So thank you for that, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Feel free to ask any last-minute question if you have some. Okay, well, otherwise, I'm going to wish everybody good night. Um, yes, and good luck to everyone applying this cycle. Yes. All right. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm.